One of the greatest obstacles to crafting health and wellness is identifying and controlling inflammation. It's at the core of all complex and chronic diseases, and it's the driving mechanism that underlies the most common symptoms that people like you struggle to overcome. Join us as we explore cutting-edge science and research to give you the information and tools you need to create the quality of life you want and deserve. And now, here is the host of Inflammation Nation, Dr. Stephen Noseworthy. Hey there, and welcome back to Inflammation Nation. I'm Dr. Noseworthy. We're continuing on our discussion of cortisol. It seems that in, in our little mini-series here about hormones and health, we're, I guess, stuck, if you will, in discussing cortisol. And, and I mentioned before that perhaps one of the reasons for this is just simply the role, the central role that cortisol plays in human function and physiology. Uh, because it is hooked into and, and is an integral part of our uh, safety mechanisms, our survival systems, um, it's kind of obligated or it's an obligatory thing that cortisol and stress systems or stress chemistry, if you want to call it that, um, are connected to pretty much everything else, right? Basically, when you're faced with a truly life-threatening situation, you need everything to change to promote survival. So what I want to talk about today is um, it's kind of a, a little bit of a dangerous thing just simply because there are so many nuances and exceptions to how cortisol has impacts on other systems, in, including the reproductive system or let's say reproductive hormones. And um, so what I want to do is just kind of give you a general overview of, of how those relationships are laid out and what the framework is. And then we'll talk about just one particular instance that seems to be um, relatively common uh, in women, particularly women, because the impacts are, are more significant for women or female physiology than for male physiology. But we're going to talk about a couple of instances, at least that I see on a frequent enough basis in my own practice and have seen them for a couple of decades now, that it's just worthwhile mentioning. Um, and obviously there's, we could do a deep dive into multiple parts of what I'm going to talk about today. So let me just kind of give you the, the, the big picture overview. So the first thing to understand is that cortisol, um, not cortisol within physiological ranges, but when I say, when I say cortisol has this impact, I'm, I'm talking about when things get out of control. And so I'm, I'm talking either about the impacts of having supra physiological levels of cortisol being locked into some kind of a stress response where you're making more cortisol than you would under normal circumstances. Um, or in some cases, we might be talking about infra physiological responses where your cortisol levels are, are too low. And in fact, I'll probably save that conversation for our next episode where we'll talk about the impact of cortisol on leaky gut, which is a very interesting topic, at least to me anyways. But generally, cortisol is bad or cortisol elevations are bad for your entire reproductive system, right? Remember, these are all relationships between the brain and some kind of an end organ that makes other hormones. And so we talk about the hypothalamus, hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis. Now we're going to, and we talked about the thyroid axis the last time I think it was. And so today it's the HPG axis or the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis. And very much like the relationship of elevated cortisol's impact on every aspect of the thyroid system, we can say pretty, pretty confidently that cortisol elevations can have an impact, a negative impact, on almost every aspect of the gonadal system as well. So one of the things that we know, and you know, again, re remember that there's a hierarchy of function, that the hypothalamus talks to the pituitary, which then talks to a reproductive organ, which then makes an, uh, a hormone that has to interact with a hormonal receptor at the cellular level for something to happen. And so one of the things that we know about excess cortisol is that it inhibits the production of something called gonadotropin-releasing hormone, or also known as GnRH, from the hypothalamus. And that's really the first step in how these reproductive hormonal systems work, is that the hypothalamus has to send a hormonal signal to the pituitary. And what ends up happening with excess cortisol is that the pituitary receives a weaker signal signal 
from the hypothalamus. Remember, the hypothalamus is first, pituitary gland is second. And so if the pituitary gland receives a weak signal that in essence translates into make less or fewer hormones, then one impact that cortisol can have on reproduction levels or reproductive hormone levels is that you're going to make less hormones. And that's up in the brain. Not that you make the hormones in the brain, but the impact is at that control center up in the brain and the hypothalamus. But, you know, it also does the same thing with the pituitary gland. And so if gonadotropin-releasing hormone, or GnRH, is the signal that comes from the hypothalamus to the pituitary, and then if the signal is adequate, the pituitary makes two other hormones called luteinizing hormone and follicle-stimulating hormone, or LH and FSH, then if the signal coming from the pituitary to, I'm sorry, from the hypothalamus to the pituitary is weak, you're going to get less pituitary output. So not only is there the direct impact or the indirect impact of inhibiting how the hypothalamus talks to the pituitary, excess cortisol also has a direct inhibitory effect on the pituitary itself. And so we kind of get with, with active stress responses where cortisol levels are elevated, particularly if they're elevated very high or if they're elevated for prolonged periods of time, uh, we get this both this direct and indirect inhibition of hormone production from central command, if you will. And so again, we see hypothalamic output go down and as a direct and indirect result of cortisol, we see a decrease of luteinizing hormone and follicle stimulating hormone coming from the pituitary. Now, why is that important? Well, because LH and FSH, these pituitary hormones in both men and women govern the production of your reproductive hormones, and that's progesterone, estrogen, and testosterone. And, and the relationships are just a little bit different. For example, in, in females, luteinizing hormone drives the production of progesterone from the ovaries, mostly from the ovaries, because you, you can make it in the adrenal gland, for example. But in a, a woman who's in her reproductive years and she's actively cycling, most of this is coming from Hi there, it's um, Dr. the pitu- uh, from sorry the, the glandular system from the ovarian the system. Nation. And so in women, LH drives progesterone production, but in men, it drives the production of testosterone or androgens. Nevertheless, this luteinizing hormone signal from the pituitary is absolutely critical to drive these main or major reproductive hormones. Um, And then the other pituitary hormone called FSH or follicle stimulating hormone in women drives the production of estrogen. And in the cycling woman, the most most powerful one ever is estradiol. There are three different types of estrogens. Estradiol is the main one, the most powerful one. The steps to but in men, follicle stimulating hormone um, basically determines the production of sperm, the or the technical term would be spermatogenesis. But you know, nevertheless, whatever the impact is of these pituitary hormones on male and female reproductive physiology, the bottom line is when we have these really severe or chronic stress responses in elevated cortisol, we inhibit the entire system and it starts up in that control center in the hypothalamus and the pituitary with both direct and indirect influences, depending on if we're looking at either, um, you know, the hypothalamus or the pituitary itself. Now, there are, um, you know, other relationships with how cortisol might impact how these reproductive hormones are being processed once they're in circulation. And you might remember we had that discussion about hormone processing when we talked about the thyroid system. And there are some relationships where cortisol may have an impact on receptor sensitivity. I don't want to get into those things because I think there are a couple of other Um, more common variables or problems that deserve some mention. And the first thing is to talk about something called a pregnenolone steal. Some people might call it a cortisol steal, but you know, you, you might be interested sometime to go like go to Google images and just search for uh, something. Just call it like the hormone cascade, hormone cascade. And what you'll see is you'll, you'll see all these images come up that basically look like a flow chart of how your body makes these steroid-based hormones. And and you might remember from an earlier episode in the hormone series that we have both peptide hormones like thyroid or insulin, and we have steroid-based hormones, which are actually made from cholesterol. 
one of the re many reasons why you need to have uh, adequate cholesterol levels. So just to map it out very, very quickly, your body takes cholesterol and creates another hormone called pregnenolone. And pregnenolone is considered by many to be the mother hormone simply because from pregnenolone, depending on which enzyme pathways are active, you can make all the other steroid hormones. So for example, from pregnenolone, you can make progesterone. From pregnenolone, you can make uh, DHEA, and both progesterone and DHEA can be converted into other things. In fact, you can Google one of these hormone cascade charts and you can kind of track it down and realize that from cholesterol and the mother hormone pregnenolone, you can make progesterone, aldosterone, which is involved in um, electrolyte and mineral and water balance. You can make cortisol, you can make DHEA, which is another adrenal hormone, and you can make all three of the estrogens, estradiol, estrone, and estriol, and you can make all three of the androgens, which is androstenedione, dione, testosterone, and dihydrotestosterone. Not that we're going to break things down to that granular level, but the bottom line is this. Your cells take cholesterol, make pregnenolone, and from pregnenolone, they make everything else. And so what happens is in, in what's called the, the pregnenolone steel, and that's the term that's more often than not used in the medical research. When people are subject to severe stressors or prolonged stressors or a combination of those, what tends to happen is the, the body prioritizes, in, it, in its innate intelligence, the body prioritizes the production of cortisol to maintain adaptability to that ongoing or severe stressor. And what that means is that your body will intelligently begin to divert resources away from other parts of that hormone cascade to make sure that it maintains cortisol sufficiency. And this is really critically important. We see this all the time when we do, uh, if we have a chance to, you know, not just map out somebody's circadian rhythm using saliva testing, but, you know, we can do free fraction hormones and saliva and take, take a look at the whole picture all at one time. And so what we can do is we can we can basically determine not just the total cortisol production, high, low, or normal, not only the circadian rhythm, which is about rhythm and timing of producing cortisol, we can kind of put people on a continuum of whether or not any given degree of abnormal adrenal function is having an impact on these other systems. Because if you if you have um, you know chronic stressors and you've got an abnormal circadian rhythm, for example, and the hormone cascade shows that there's not much of an impact, meaning you don't see reductions in progesterone at the same time. You don't see um, reductions in either male or female hormones, androgens or estrogens at the same time. Then we can conclude that that is, even though there's a circadian rhythm disruption, that problem is not as significant as if we were to see alterations in those reproductive hormone pathways. Because when stress is prolonged and, and severe, over a period of time, you see this reprioritization and your body steals the raw material away from cholesterol and pregnenolone, steals it away from progesterone pathways, away from the androgen pathways, away from the estrogen pathways to divert all that raw material to make sure that you can continue to make enough cortisol. And this is kind of like, you know, it certainly doesn't happen all the time, but it happens enough that it's been you know, it's been researched, it's been studied, we know about it, and fortunately we have testing to be able to figure all of that out. Now, obviously, if there is a reproductive hormone imbalance, there are many other reasons that can promote that. And so we can't we don't want to lay everything at the at the feet of stress or stress chemistry, but certainly we can use fundamental, simple, uh, not very expensive testing to get a, a picture of or get a whole picture of what's going on with relationship to circadian rhythms, reproductive hormone levels and physiology, and see whether or not somebody's in part of this um, pregnenolone steel, if you will. And it can be very, very advantageous from a clinical standpoint if you can pinpoint these problems to be able to implement strategies to take the stress off the system and to even give the body some of the raw materials that it needs. And, you know, and this is kind of an aside, but we talked about how all of our steroid hormones are made from cholesterol. You know, you can imagine in uh, 
in the effort to promote lower and lower and lower levels of cholesterol for cardiovascular health. And I, and I would argue that that's a little bit misguided, <laughs> maybe a little, maybe a lot misguided. Um, but you can imagine that there would be a threshold below which if your cholesterol drops, you're not going to be able to make sufficient hormones to run your androgen pathways, your estrogen pathways, your progesterone pathways, or even produce your stress hormones, cortisol and DHA. In fact, we, we do see this, that some people have very, very low cholesterol and, and sometimes it's genetic. And basically because they don't have enough raw building block material, they can't make hormones uh, to run other systems. And, and that uh, can be obviously quite problematic. Um, so what I want to do now, that's kind of like the general picture. And again, it might be very helpful for you to just Google the hormone cascade and take a look at how all these things connect together. But what I want to do right now is I want to kind of isolate progesterone and talk about the relationship between progesterone and cortisol. In fact, we're going to, we're going to reverse that relationship. We're going to talk about how progesterone has an impact on cortisol and how that might translate into some relatively common clinical problems with things like anxiety or stress or insomnia. A lot of times we see those things together. And, I, and I'm talking about heightened states. You know, even just the average person may periodically or intermittently have problems sleeping. There's many reasons why that can be. We might get anxious in certain circumstances, but it doesn't mean we're anxious in terms of our core physiology and our makeup. But there do seem to be some circumstances where uh, and for example, it's very common with uh, women who have, they still have their menstrual cycle and they have a lot of PMS symptomatology that they have, um, you know, not just for example, pain and cramping and that kind of stuff or changes in their menstrual flow itself. They end up having uh, mood changes. They get very weepy. They get uh, anxious or nervous, or if they have a history of anxiety or even OCD, it gets magnified during that week right before the cycle starts, that pre that premenstrual period. We can also see some of the same things in woman, women who are either uh, perimenopausal or postmenopausal, particularly if they are using progesterone-based hormone replacement therapy. So let's talk about this. Um, so the, this is all rooted in the fact that progesterone and cortisol share a binding protein. And if you've been listening to this mini series on hormones, you know, early on, we talked about how all hormones in circulation are either bound to a carrier protein or they're not. And if they're not, we call that free fraction. Generally, we can talk about bound or unbound or bound hormones and free fraction hormones or free hormones. And, and it's the same across all hormone subsets. There's a, a binding protein uh, usually there's multiple albumin quite often plays a role in binding uh, hormones, but typically it's a kind of a, a muted role. It's not the primary binder. But nevertheless, um, there is a, a binding protein called, well, there's two names for it. One is called transcortin, and the other name is cortisol binding protein or some variation of that. And so transcortin and, and cortisol binding protein are the same thing. But the point is, is that uh, progesterone and cortisol are both bound by the same binding protein. And, and whenever you have a scenario like that, what ends up happening is that if you have a significant increase or decrease of one of those two hormones that share the binding protein, then you automatically shift in one direction or another the free fraction or the unbound portion or the bound portion of the opposite hormone. For example, um, if I have an increase in progesterone, if it's sufficient, right? Because, you know, minor increases are not going to do this. But if I have a sufficiently uh, or a sufficient increase in my progesterone levels, that is going to use up more of the cortisol binding protein or this protein called transcortin. So that progesterone uses up more of that compared to cortisol. And so even though we're not changing the amount of total cortisol that's in circulation, by having more progesterone in the system, it uses more of the binding protein, which means there's less for cortisol to be bound. And that translates into an increase in free fraction or biologically available cortisol. Let, let me say that one more time, that if we have a significant enough increase of progesterone, it will take up or use up more of the transcortin binding protein 
translating into an increase in free fraction or biologically available cortisol, even though you're not increasing the total amount of cortisol that's in circulation. It's just a shift in the relative proportion of how much is bound and biologically inactive versus how much is unbound or free fraction and biologically active. And, and so, you know, what this ends up trans... Actually, you know what? Let me, let me say this. Um, think about the, the, the children's game uh, musical chairs. I guess adults play that too, but, um, you know, think about musical chairs. You, you have only so many chairs to go around and you have more people than chairs. And when the music stops, whoever sits on a chair gets to stay and whoever's standing has to go sit down. Now it's an imperfect analogy, but I think you get the, the mental picture is that if you imagine, um, cortisol and progesterone are circling around the chairs and when the music stops, if you have a lot more progesterones than cortisol, then you're going to end up with more progesterones sitting in the chair that would be analogous to the binding protein binding to progesterone. And you end up with more cortisol standing up, not in a chair, and that's your free fraction. And, and it, I think that's probably the best analogy that I can come up with that explains this kind of competitive nature where if we increase progesterone, we get more free fraction cortisol because we take up more of the binding protein or the reverse can happen as well. If we have a surge in cortisol, you can actually liberate um, protein bound cortisol from its binding protein. I'm sorry, protein bound progesterone from its binding protein. And so an increase in cortisol can actually increase your free fraction progesterone. And so stress can dysregulate your hormonal balance in that sense by creating more free progesterone, which may or may not have a beneficial impact. Now, having said that, and, you know, maybe if I, if you didn't catch it, just rewind and go listen to that again, because that relationship is pretty cr cr critical. So I, I recently found um, a study that was published in the journal Neurobiology and Stress. This was back in 2016. So it's a relatively recent paper. And the title of the paper is Stress-Induced Increases in Progesterone and Cortisol in Naturally Cycling Women. And what they did is they, they measured both cortisol and progesterone, and they split the people participating in the study up into two groups. Um, and they, had, uh, they, they exposed them to either nothing or to what they call a cold stressor, which in, in essence is like an ice bath. And then they measured changes in cortisol and progesterone. And what they found was really kind of interesting because as you would suspect, because being plunged into an ice bath is a thermal stressor, there was actually an increase in cortisol as a result of that. That was you know prolonged for a period of time. It, it certainly didn't last hours, but it was measurable and it was significant. But what they also found was that there was an increase in progesterone. And this study, as well as others, lay out this relationship that if there is an increase in progesterone, then it tends to increase free cortisol because there is this competitive nature or relationship for the binding protein. And in a circumstance where we have some kind of a stressor that increases both your total cortisol and your total progesterone, if progesterone sits in the chair when the music stops more than cortisol does, what we end up with is a magnification of the stress response. But here's the interesting thing. It, this was done in women who were uh, cycling. They had their menstrual cycle. Um, the, the impact actually depended on where they were in their menstrual cycle. So if a woman in the study was in the first half or what's called the follicular phase of their menstrual cycle, which naturally has a low progesterone level, the stress had no impact on that free cortisol because whatever increase in progesterone came about was only being added on to a low level of progesterone to begin with. But on the other hand, if, if a woman in the study was in the second half of her cycle where progesterone production is higher because that's what's needed in that second half of the cycle, then that cold stressor had a significant impact where we have more progesterone being produced in a naturally higher progesterone state. And now we see this competition with the cortisol binding protein. And e even though there might be an increase in cortisol production, the main impact was the fact that there was more free fraction cortisol available because there was less binding protein to inactivate it. And this has a lot of implications 
uh, for example, for women with PMS symptomatology, particularly if we see that insomnia and, and mood changes and anxiety and so on, um, because that's naturally that first that week before the cycle starts, maybe 10 days for some people, um, that is a period where progesterone is naturally higher. Now, it can be low for some people, but that's the way it's designed. It's designed to be a, a naturally high progesterone period of time. And if you end up with stressors during that period of time, the translation is you get a magnification of the stress response, which can have multiple impacts. So this, you know, the implications of this is, it is twofold. Number one is you're adding more progesterone through stress to women who are already in a relatively higher progesterone state. And if someone has a high normal to elevated cortisol profile in addition to that, then there's your your double whammy. You get the massive surge in progesterone and you get the increase of free fraction pro, uh, cortisol during a period of time when cortisol levels are high anyways, because that's what their starting point was. There's a couple of more things that I want to talk about before we bring this episode to a close. Um, that mechanism that I just laid out for you would also be true of women who are not cycling anymore, say, you know, peri or postmenopausal, who are on some form of hormone replacement that includes progesterone. Think about that. It's, I mean, whether whether your progesterone levels are elevated because you're on the second half of your cycle and, and you're in your reproductive years, or because you're taking it exogenously, either on a pill or a shot or a pellet or a cream, it doesn't really matter. Um, if you are walking around in a state of natural or imposed elevated progesterone, then stress is going to do or has the potential to do the same thing. Now, for the most part, progesterone hormone replacement, particularly bioidentical, is safe. And some women can actually handle very large doses of progesterone without having any problems, but that doesn't mean everyone can. And so these discussions are helpful for people who don't fit into, you know, maybe that, you know, we're talking about the exception rather than the rule, but sometimes the exceptions are common enough that it might be rule number two. So there are some instances when adding progesterone can really ramp somebody up. And we see this increase in, in anxiety or nervousness or this emotional lability and quite often with uh, insomnia patterns, either not being able to fall asleep or just waking up constantly. And there are two possible reasons for this. Number one is, and, and this one's relatively rare, um, this is called neurosteroid sensitivity, which involves an, an increase in the sensitivity of progesterone receptors so that when you increase progesterone levels, you get this massive impact on the system and it's just not something your body's ready to handle. Or there's a, a second mechanism or another possible reason why progesterone might ramp someone else up. And that's because of this relationship we're talking about. And there's probably the more common reason why this happens is where stress increases both progesterone and cortisol, but they share the same binding protein. And if progesterone wins by sitting down in the chairs when the music stops, then you have basically an instantaneous increase in your free cortisol, which is no different than having an acute stressor. Now, in the first case of this neurosteroid sensitivity, it's helpful to do things to downregulate that sensitivity. And most of these are based on the action of GABA, GABA, that's your primary inhibitory neurotransmitter. And probably the most important thing to talk about here is very quickly that GABA as a neurotransmitter, as a calming neurotransmitter, is made as a byproduct of energy metabolism. You make your own GABA, therefore you don't necessarily need to take it. And there are other possible issues with taking GABA anyways. We'll eventually talk about somewhere else. But as long as you have good energy metabolism, whether you're burning carbohydrates or fats as fuel, you're eating enough food and eating on some kind of a schedule or frequency that matches your physiology, then you should naturally be making GABA on your own. But if you want to, say, boost natural GABA production, you know, you can look into using supplements like L-theanine or uh, P5P, vitamin B6, passionflower, or valerian root. And I'm just going to leave that there because what I want to do is talk about the second mechanism, which is the most common one, and then we'll close out for today. The second issue related to cortisol uh, 
free fraction cortisol is going up because progesterone is going up and competing for the binding protein, um, you know, really the approach to that is twofold. Number one is finding the lowest dose and delivery method that has a positive impact on progesterone levels, but without causing the overstimulation. And so, you know, one lady might be able to handle 200 milligrams of progesterone a day. Somebody else might need 30, right? Why, they, this is all about biochemical individuality. We can't have a one-size-fits-all solution when it comes to hormone um, augmentation or hormone replacement therapy. So the first thing is to find that lowest dose and delivery method that has an impact without causing the overstimulation. The delivery method is important because you get different bioavailability levels if you're you know, taking a micronized oil versus something that's sublingual versus something that's injected versus something that you, you know, put on your skin as a, as a topical or a transdermal. But the other part of this is, is assessing and addressing your adrenal dysfunction. Because if you're starting with an elevated level of cortisol and you toss a whole bunch of progesterone in there that your body's not ready to handle, then you end up with more free cortisol on top of an already elevated cortisol stance. So let me back up. It's a twofold approach. Find the lowest dose and delivery method of progesterone that doesn't overstimulate you and then figure out what's going on with your adrenal system and then fixing that. And I'll, you know, refer you back to some of the prior episodes as to, you know, clues as to what might happen. Obviously, this is not direct medical advice because this is just general concepts and education. So let's finish with this. The general rule is this, is that the more balanced your total cortisol production and circadian rhythm are, probably the more progesterone you can tolerate. But if your total cortisol production is elevated and you're locked into this stress response or you have this unnatural circadian rhythm where levels are too high only at certain times of the day, then you may have a problem tolerating higher doses of progesterone. And if it is causing anxiety and insomnia and nervousness and mood changes, then you might want to think about pulling back on your dosing, changing your delivery method, have that conversation with your prescribing practitioner. Don't do it just based on what I'm saying here. And at the same time, assessing and addressing whatever adrenal dysfunction you have. Let me throw in one final thing is that this conversation has been under the context of all other things being equal, <laughs> meaning we're talking about these relationships in isolation, but the body's not designed that way. The body's a very intricate, interconnected system made up of multiple other subsystems that all interconnect with each other. And so quite often we see this progesterone sensitivity and these relationships with cortisol in people who have, for example, a history of concussion. If you have a circumstance where your brain is super sensitized, it's very easy to get the wrong reaction or something you're not expecting when you change the hormonal environment. And we also tend to see this in, in people who have suffered various forms of abuse, whether that's physical or sexual or emotional and mental. It's all the same to the brain and to the body. And um, if you want to learn a little bit more about this, uh, you might want to look back in the list of these podcast episodes and, and look for the one that has the word mesolimbic plasticity. I think it's titled Anxiety, Insomnia, and Mesolimbic Plasticity, where I talk about how the brain can get super sensitized from stress or injury or inflammation, and it just starts behaving poorly. All right, we'll leave it there. Next time when we come back, we're going to talk about the impact of cortisol on leaky gut. Take care. Thank you so much for listening to the Inflammation Nation. If you found this episode valuable, please rate, review, and subscribe to our podcast. Be the first to know when a new episode drops so that you can stay on top of your game. It also helps others like you find the answers they need. And why not head over to my main website, drnoseworthy.com, that's drnoseworthy.com, to explore my personalized functional medicine coaching programs, submit a question to the podcast, maybe take a quiz, or even reach out to me using the contact form that you can find there. We'll see you next time.